So the question is, do I believe in the same God as the Jews of today? No, I do not. The Jews of today believe in a God that their rabbis invented in the 5th century in their Talmud. I believe in the Jewish God of the Old Testament who was one God in essence in three hypostases. So ladies and gentlemen, what I'd like to talk about today is the contrast between what the scriptures call Christians to be and what we are in this country in comparison to the weakness of the liberal state that we see regularly cowering and pivoting away from its own values and beliefs because of the aggression of others, particularly militant Islam. We've seen today, ladies and gentlemen, in our country many examples of the liberal state compromising on its own beliefs. Batley and Spen, where a teacher is in hiding under police protection because of the threats of Muslim thugs to their life because they taught about blasphemy. The fact that the state has cowered before protests outside of a school that taught transgender to students and Muslims protested outside of that school and the state cowered. Again and again and again we see examples of where the liberal state is unable to stand up for its own values and its own beliefs. No, what about the church? We see many limp-wristed Christians who are shy and timid about their Christianity, unable to stand up with conviction and courage for what they believe and the values that they live by. We have in the West a weak and cowardly church that is frightened of conflict and that is frightened of confrontation, that all too often is willing to compromise on core beliefs for the sake of political correctness. But does this match up with what the Bible is teaching us? In Ephesians 6.11, we read, Put on the full armour of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. In Ephesians 6.13, we read, Therefore, put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, now notice what the scriptures are saying. To stand firm against the schemes of the devil. To stand your ground. In 1 Peter 5, 9, it says, But resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering is being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. The Christian faith teaches the man to have inner solidity, inner conviction of his beliefs, and to stand on those beliefs with an inner firmness. The kind of soy milk Christianity that you see on the BBC is not a true reflective of what Christianity is or what Christianity teaches. Christianity teaches us to stand with firmness and conviction in our beliefs, to resist the schemes of the devil, to stand firm in our resistance. That means that as Christians, we must stand firm 
against the pro-abortionist. We must stand firm against the LGBTQT ideology. We must stand firm against Islamization. We must stand firm against communists. We must stand firm against ethno-nationalists. Christians are called to resist. You resist in your heart, in your mind, with your lips and with your hands. You resist by organization. You resist as an individual. You resist in your workplace. You resist in politics. You resist in economics. When we Christians are called to resist, I ask you brothers and sisters, how well organized is your church to resist the narratives and the lies of the devil that are being propagated through political correctness, through the liberal state, through progressive ideology and all that it stands for in its lies about equality, tolerance and diversity. How well are your churches organized to resist Islamization in our society, in our culture? The Bible calls us to resist and to stand firm upon what we believe. And what do we believe as Christians? We believe the canons of the Holy Council of Constantinople and Nicaea, that creed that Christians have recited faithfully for 1,700 years is what we believe and what we stand upon. Christian values are what we find described in the Bible. Those are the values that we must stand on and defend. What are the ethics that we live by? Virtue ethics is what Christians are called to live by. Not some rule-based system like Sharia law, not some rule-based system like the philosophies of the Enlightenment, but based upon the virtue ethics of the scriptures. It says in 1 Corinthians, 1558 be steadfast be immovable always abounding in the work of the Lord Christians do you have that inner solidity within your soul that you are immovable upon the truth that you are steadfast upon the truth of the faith that against all enemies of the gospel, you will stand and resist. That is what the Bible teaches. And that is why we know that Christianity does not teach pacifism. Because you cannot stand and resist the schemes of the devil that operate in the world if you decide that you cannot defend your own body and the body of your own community. We Christians must organize in our fellowships, organize networks of resistance to help our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world who are dying in their tens of thousands in Nigeria, who are being persecuted in Pakistan, Egypt, Libya, Syria, Iraq, Indonesia, North Korea, China, Burma, wherever Christians are suffering, Christians must organize to help our brothers and sisters. And that means, brothers and sisters, you must organize at the level higher than the congregation, higher than the fellowship. This is not an individual effort. It is a group effort that we must stand by. 
in Philippians. Chapter 1, verse 27, we read, Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit. As Christians, we must stand together as one people against the enemies of the church. And there are real enemies against the church. The liberal progressive is an enemy of the church. Hindutva in India is an enemy of the church. The Islamist is an enemy of the church. The militant atheist is an enemy of the church. The communist is an enemy of the church. The Nazi is an enemy of the church. And we are called to resist them all, to stand firm. How can we stand firm unless we recover the love of martyrdom for Jesus Christ, of paying with our blood and our lives for the cause of the gospel and the cause of the church. The reason why you don't hear this preached in your Sunday church is because your Sunday church is led by effeminate cowards and wimps who cower against those who persecute the church, against those who discriminate against Christians. But that is not what the Bible calls us to. In 1 Corinthians 6.13 we read, Be on alert, stand firm in the faith, Act like men, be strong. How many wimpy Christians do you know? How many beta males in the church do you know? How many soy boy Christians in the church do you know? Who cower from conflict, run from confrontation, avoid battle. But the faith teaches us, it teaches us to be alert to be aware that the enemy has schemes against the church. And those schemes express themselves politically, economically, socially, culturally. But we are called to be alert to them and to stand firm in the faith. To stand firm in something, you must first know what it is that you stand upon. To stand firm in the faith means you must know what it is to be a Christian. And how many of you know what Christians believe? Know what Christians value? Know what ethics we live by? Know our traditions, our customs? We as Christians must know our faith to stand in it. And then it says to act like men. <coughs> You're going to have to move it a bit. <coughs> Bear with us. Could you hold that a minute? That'd be great. <coughs> then it says to us. To act like men. What does it mean to act like a man? It means to shoulder responsibility without quaking. It means to rise to the challenge without fear. <coughs> it means to conduct yourself with humility. It means to defend your community to stand up for what is right and what is just. It means to let your sword be tempered by compassion and mercy. 
If you want to know what looking like a Christian man looks like, go and look up the chivalric code. The code of chivalry written in the medieval period. <coughs> Sorry, I'm just suffering from a bit of hay fever. So I'm going to have to toad it down a bit. It says in Philippians, chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way, stand firm in the Lord. Again and again and again, the Bible calls us Christians to stand with firmness and conviction. So, ladies and gentlemen, are there any questions so far? Any questions? Going once. The chivalric code. If you want to know what it looks like to be a Christian man, go and study the chivalric code. Any other questions before I press on in this presentation? Going once, going twice, going three times. Okay, I'm going to tell you four things that you can do to cultivate this firmness and inner solidity and inner strength to stand on the faith. The first one is that you must know the faith. You must study what it means to be a Christian. Study the doctrines, study the values, study the ethics of our religion. The second thing that you must do is to know the history of the church. Your identity as a Christian, your identity as a Christian can only be... Bro, bro, bro. Don't feed the trolls. They feed on your energy. The more you give them attention, the more they behave like this. I am Messiah. But ladies and gentlemen, as Christians, the only way that you can know what it is to be a Christian is to know your history. Know the history of the church because your identity as a Christian can only go as deep as your knowledge of the history of the church. The next thing, the third thing that you can do to deepen your faith and your identity as a Christian is know the why. Know the why of what you believe. Know the why of why you have the values you do as a Christian. Know the why as to what ethical system you follow. The fourth thing that you can do to cultivate this inner conviction as a Christian is to cement your identity with actions. You must live like a Christian Live like a Christian in your choice, your choices, where you shop, who you vote for, what clothes you wear, why you choose to watch X rather than Y, why you choose to support this cause rather than that cause. The Christian faith is a complete way of life. And if it does not affect every aspect of your life, then you are treating your faith as a hobby, not as an identity. The final thing that you can do to help build inner solidity, inner firmness, inner strength in your Christian identity is to use your imagination in spiritual devotions in which through imaginative contemplation of God, of Christ, of his incarnation, of his crucifixion, of his resurrection, of his return, of his judgment, that in your inner man, 
and in your inner woman you offer your soul and body to him as a living sacrifice which is your acceptable act of worship as a sensible people these are four things that you can do to build an inner conviction the church is dying in the west because we treat our faith like a hobby we treat our faith like it is some kind of social club we treat our faith like a civic religion we want the victory without the sacrifice we want the victory without the war but the scriptures call us to war it calls us to do battle against evil and to fight that battle you must have inner strength you must have inner conviction the soy boy church of the west is dying because it is weak because our bishops are weak our pastors are weak our priests are weak and through their sermons and their activities they have made all of us weak any questions on the topic any questions on the topic what are the teachings of jesus in a nutshell the teachings of jesus in a nutshell to follow him and to become like him and the way that you become like him is by cultivating virtue in your soul. The virtue of faith, hope, love, chastity, prudence, courage. These are the kinds of virtues that you cultivate within your soul. And by cultivating those virtues, you'll begin to look like Jesus Christ and conform to his image on earth. Any other questions on topic? Any questions going once? Any questions going twice? Any questions going three times? Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Do you want another question? Thanks be to God. Any questions about Christianity, ladies and gentlemen? If you've got a question about the Christian faith, this is your chance to ask. Oh. Wendell Denison Street, Mike, a quick question. After you finish your presentation... About Christianity. It is about Christianity. After you finish your speak, are you prepared to engage with my online viewers about... Ask them to ask a question on Christianity. Ask them now. Ask them now. No, ask them now. Any questions about Christianity, ladies and gentlemen? Because it takes time. I want to challenge you, brothers and sisters, that the reason why we are not having the impact and the reason why no one has interest in the Christian faith today is because our fellowships are weak and everyone knows that we are a weak community but the reason why we are weak is not because we lack conviction the reason why we are weak as christians is because we lack organization the highest level that we christians organize at is the level of the congregation but we need to organize as a people across the denominations to stand up for what we believe in and to make an impact in our communities socially, culturally, economically, politically. I encourage all of you to go and buy a book called The Benedict Option. The Benedict Option is a book that I encourage you to buy because it is the only model of church that will allow Christians to regain the initiative. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Have you got any questions? Any questions going once? 
It's from Uncle Fafu. Question. What is the best book to read on the factual history of Christianity? Ladies and gentlemen, the question is, what book should you buy to learn about the facts of the Christian faith? I would suggest that you start with any of the writings of England's own chief theologian, N.T. Wright. Any book by N.T. Wright. Any other questions? You had a question. Yes. How do, we, how do we identify with the sufferings of Christ? The question, ladies and gentlemen, is how do we identify with the sufferings of Christ? You identify with the sufferings of Christ when you identify with the sufferings of the body of Christ. Our brothers and sisters are suffering in Nigeria. Tens of thousands have been slaughtered this year by Islamic jihadists and you never heard a word of it because the media sweeps it under the table because they don't want conflict in this country so they sacrifice the Christians of Nigeria the Christians of Pakistan are suffering at the hands of the jihadists the Christians of Iraq and Syria are suffering at the hands of the jihadists Christians in every single Islamic society around the world, without exception, are being persecuted and discriminated against. Why, Christians, are you not organizing to stand up for your brothers and sisters abroad when Christians are being discriminated against here in this country? Why are you not organizing to stand up for your brothers and sisters who are suffering in this country. You identify with the sufferings of Christ when you identify with the sufferings of his holy church. Any other questions? I've got a number of questions for you, Bob. Go on. Street Mike, man. Why don't you believe in the Quran when it believes in Jesus Christ as a prophet sent by God? And his other question. Great. So the question is, what was the question? Why as a Christian do I not believe in the Quran yeah. when the Quran believes in Jesus Christ? Well, firstly, the Quran does not believe in the Jesus Christ of the Gospels. If you look at the Jesus Christ of the Gospels, yeah and you compare him to this fictitious character called Isa in the Quran. They're completely different people. The Jesus Christ of the New Testament is the Messiah of Old Testament prophecy. That character in the Old Testament is a divine figure. The Quran says that Jesus was not divine. The Gospel Jesus dies on a cross and rises on the third day. The Isa of the Quran never dies on a cross, even though the Quran contradicts all the evidence of history written by Roman historians, Jewish historians, early church fathers, and the New Testament itself. The Jesus of the Quran is one who speaks as a child. That's a story that is stolen from the infant Arabic gospel. It's plagiarized from an earlier Gnostic sect. We Christians believe that Christ performed his first miracle as an adult. Brothers and sisters, whoever you are and whatever your background, Understand that when the politicians say to you that all religions teach the same, they have lied to you. There is no such thing as Abrahamic faiths. There is one Abrahamic faith, and it is the Judeo-Christian faith alone. Any other questions? There's another question, sir. So, so, no, 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 so, let me, I'm sorry, go on. Yeah, there's another question from Stompzilla. Ask Bob, 
Do you believe in the same Sorry, I'm taking a question from him. Could you just wait? Sorry, say again. Godzilla has art. Does Bob believe in the same God like the Jews do? So the question is, do I believe in the same God as the Jews of today? No, I do not. The Jews of today believe in a God that their rabbis invented in the 5th century in their Talmud. I believe in the Jewish God of the Old Testament who was one God in essence in three hypostases. The Old Testament speaks of the Ruach of Yahweh, the Spirit of Yahweh, and it speaks of the Angel of Yahweh. The Angel of Yahweh is described as God. The Spirit of God is obviously divine. And the fact that these are of God shows that God himself is another hypostasis. But it says in Deuteronomy 6.4 that remember, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. That means these three hypostases are the same essence. So I believe in the God of the Old Testament. The Jews of today do not believe in that God. Any other questions on Christianity? There are no more questions, so I'll allow you to continue, sir. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your time. I'm going to take a short break before I start again. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, what happened there, Bob Sila? Just want to talk about the fact that the Bible calls us to a kind of spirituality we aren't being taught in the church. Yeah. A spirit, spirituality of inner strength in our beliefs. A spirituality of inner conviction in our values. And I want to challenge you and put in the comments, how many times have you heard a sermon like that on a Sunday? Why have you not heard the calling for inner strength and inner conviction in your beliefs as Christians? How can we possibly expect to win this battle in the world if we approach it like wimps, soy boys and limp-wristed cowards? You have got to have courage, conviction, determination to win any battle. You have to be determined to win. And right now, too many in the church are more determined to compromise and get along for the sake of multiculturalism and that false ideology of the state than they are willing to defend the Christian faith. I'm going to take five minutes and then we're going to go and do something different. That's what I feel like.